All right, welcome back to Running with the Wolves. I'm Christian and this is Dustin. We are here to bring you everything in the world of track and field and running um, from high school athletics all the way to ultra marathoners. And speaking of marathoners, uh, we have an amazing guest on today, Jared Ward, um, collegiate athlete at BYU, now teacher and an amazing marathoner who just most recently uh, finished six in Rio. Um, so give him a warm welcome, guys. And Dustin, you are open up for questions. All right. Uh, so first off, thanks, Jared, for coming on. Uh, it's a real honor. Um, been watching you for thanks a long for time. Thanks for having me, you guys. Oh, anytime. Um, so first off, the first question, I guess, is uh, what made you decide to go to BYU of all universities? <laughs> so I'm a Utah boy. Um, yeah. BYU wasn't far from home. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, in fact, I had almost committed to another school here in Utah before I began being recruited by BYU, and uh, I was kind of a late bloomer in high school. But when I went on my recruiting trip to BYU, I loved Coach Highstone. I loved the team. I loved the the culture here. They have an incredible athletic administration and uh, good scaffolding. Great support for their cross country and track teams. Like the the I mean the the athletic director will come to events and like he's very into it and so I feel like the support here was really good and loved coach I stone and mm -hmm. so I'm glad I glad I ended up here yeah absolutely and uh, so obviously now you're a statistics professor at BYU not I'm not sure everyone knows that but um, how does that play in uh, staying close to home obviously where you uh, build your success at the collegiate level you know I uh, I loved running in college, but I also loved studying, and I, I felt like when I realized that those two worlds could cross over, you know, my love of math and the numbers through mm -hmm. statistics and uh, and then the research as it applies to running, I was super excited. And um, I did my thesis in pace strategy in the marathon when mm -hmm. I was getting my master's degree and have continued to do some running research, and it was a very, very exciting realization that those two worlds could cross over. And, uh, and help each other. And so, I mean, I just feel so blessed to do these things that I love. Yeah. You know, and, it, and I guess we guess we call it work, but it's uh, it seems like it's all play. Yeah, absolutely. You can go ahead, Christian. And ask yeah, so want. obviously being a collegiate athlete, um, you guys focus on 5K and 10K at your highest distance. So for you running as fast time as you did in college, how did you transition coming out of college to becoming a marathon runner because obviously that is what you are you know known for now coming competing in Rio uh, most recently what made you decide to kind of switch to that transition well I think I had a, a coach um, that saw some marathon potential in me he would always say when I was uh, early in college or I, I guess maybe halfway through college when I was running well um, that he felt like I had a very efficient stride and and he thought the longer the better for me and he kind of would keep planting these marathon seeds um, in my yeah. mind but you know he was he's a very qualified coach to uh, coach somebody coming from college 5k's and 10k's to the marathon because that's what he did in his career he was a very successful college athlete he was a three-time NCAA champion um, collegiate record holder in the 10k and then he transitioned to a marathoner and competed in uh, two Olympic games in the marathon and so I feel like I had a coach who was trying to do exactly what I wanted to do and um, and I think it was his um, coaching that uh, facilitated that transition we tweaked things in our training we took it, took out some shorter stuff and added some longer tempos beefed up the long run and um and i loved the training i felt like even before i ran my first marathon i loved training for the marathon and so um i had a good coach and it seemed like a really natural fit mm -hmm. and so i kind of just slid right into it well, that is awesome because I know, you know, coming out of high school, a lot of athletes get injured really fast going to college, especially D1 colleges. Um, and then for athletes coming out of college, you know, it's hard to make that transition to the pro field and uh, jumping in with the Sharks. And especially for you, jumping into the marathon of all places, that has got to be an enormous jump in mileage, uh, stress training and speed. Um, so the fact that you could come out of that so well and take it step by step is amazing. So I guess with that being said, you know, the trials, uh, Los Angeles, obviously – uh, well known for the Olympics, um, but it was a hot, 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 dry day <laughs> uh, watching it, and you could definitely see it in the athletes' faces. Um, you know, with the stacked field and seeing people like Galen Rupp moving up to the marathon, and obviously you had Returner and Meb who had uh, won silver back in Athens, how did you feel and prepare coming for the Olympic trial marathon, especially with the conditions and stuff? Well, 
I I ran it like I had a chance to make the team. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there wasn't, I don't know that there was anybody out there, including myself, that was thinking, all right, you know, just has to go and will himself onto the team. I mean, there were so many qualified guys. You mentioned Meb and Galen, who ended up making it. Um, But Dathan Ritzenheim, who ended up being injured in some of the buildup and dropped out of the race. Um, Abdi pulled out, you know, a couple weeks before um, and then ran well at New York following the Olympics. And, And a whole bunch of other good guys that I, you know, I felt like were in, a similar position to me and Luke Piscedra and Tyler Pinnell um, and fast guys trying to debut. I mean, there were just so many people um, that I had my eyes on. I mean, my list of serious contenders was 10 or 12 long. So I approached the race like I could do it um, if things kind of bounced my way, but I don't know that I would have gone and bet the house on it. Yeah. Um, I put myself in a good position. Training had gone really well. Um, in the marathon, you kind of have the benefit of – you know, when there's 10 qualified guys on the starting line, you can look around and assume that half of them either, you know, we talked about the volume of training or you mentioned it, uh, you know, half of them are either injured or overcooked or something. And you don't know which ones, but um, but the numbers, you know, I'm the, I'm the stats guy, so mm-hmm. the numbers say that mm-hmm. half of them yeah, are. Yeah, and uh, frankly, I don't care which half are, you know, I'll know it 20 miles. Um, but, you know, I, you know, I, I knew that, my work was cut out for me, but I had a chance and it was probably maybe, you know, and who knows, but it was maybe going to be the best chance that I'd ever have. And so I just approached it with a, let's see what happens kind of attitude. And I had run really well in Los Angeles the year before, Mm -hmm. um, 2015 for the U S championships and it was hot then. And so the hotter it got, the better I felt, um, about my chances in the race. But um, it, I think it was really just taking uh, the opportunity and seeing what we could do. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, back through that, I guess, then Rio later on in the year, maybe arguably the most stacked marathon field that's ever existed. Uh, you come out and, God, there's just so many stacked people and so many former world record holders, and you came out and got sixth. What was that like? Oh, man. I, I mean, it was crazy. I still remember halfway, well, more than halfway, probably three quarters of the way through the race. Um, I was coming up on somebody and I was looking, I was like, yeah, that's a Kenyan Jersey. And I got a little bit closer and I was like, that's Stanley B. Watt. And, <laughs> you know, like that was my Olympic experience. You know, I was standing on the start line, looking at all these guys, Elliot Kipchoge yeah. and, you know, oh, yeah. and I'm like, man, I'm on the same start line as these guys. And it really, <laughs> excuse me. I think that the Olympics were, a transition for me, um, at least mentally, I went into the Olympics feeling so fortunate to be there. And mm-hmm. I really was fortunate to be oh, there. Yeah, yeah. There were a lot of, I mean, U.S. marathoning is really good right now mm-hmm. in terms of uh, where it's been at. And there were a lot of qualified guys. <laughs> and um, I felt so lucky to be there, but I left feeling like I belonged. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had a, I had a good finish and, uh, and, good opportunity there. And, uh, so there were, I mean, there were so many different emotions, uh, you know, in terms of the other athletes there and the finish and things like that. But I feel very blessed to have finished where I did. You know, it's uh, interesting you say that, uh, cause you know, we were looking back at Rio, um, and America as a whole in track and field, especially distance running. I think we really excelled at, uh, you know, you saw the girls in the steeplechase, they made their mark and were running incredibly fast times. Uh, the marathon, obviously, I mean, I was talking to my mom, my whole family was watching it and, you know, it was great to see Galen come across and finally win a medal for us, especially in a stacked field. But, you know, we almost expected it, I feel like in some ways, because he has had so much to him. And I said, you know, that's great, but you want to look at the athletes that sometimes aren't always looked at first. And when you were coming down the straightaway, I said, oh, my God. I was like, this guy was third in our trials. And I was like, because, you know, the Kenyans produce like sub 204s and they get to 203. And I said, this guy has taken out our competitors and create. I mean, he's dropping in the sub 10, like sub 10 placing. And I said, that shows you where American distance running is going is the athletes like that. We're looking at you that are working so hard who say screw time always or screw that what the other athletes have accomplished and you just go for it you know and I think what you said hits the nail on the head is that especially with runners um we always are like 
okay, we can go do this. Sub, four, For instance, breaking sub five minutes in the mile was my dream. But once I did it, I was happy for about 10 minutes, and I was like, okay, I want sub 430. That's my next year's goal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of synonymous for all runners across because it, we're constantly setting goals and trying to achieve it and trying to beat it. But Olymp- Rio was unusual because us as a, or you guys as Olympic athletes and us as you just being from the USA, um, just so much – prospect i think for america in the future you know and some of our older guys who are really good are starting to get closer to retirement and you can see that because mo farah ran with all of them and he just retired um but the usa i think is looking really promising uh and you see that marathoning obviously with shalane flanagan who had that stunning new york win um which leads us to our next question for you actually running with the athletes and even though you're a marathon runner we know you're with the 10k and 5k and uh, mile guys, um, who do you see as real up and comers, and who do you think will really help front run along with yourself in American distance running? Yeah. Um, that's a good question, and um, and it's always hard to predict the future. But I I think that you hit the nail on the head in that the the synergy is really good right now with that. And I think I think what the biggest thing that has changed is the attitude of these Olympics, of these Olympians, right? It's uh, it seems to me like the perception has changed in America from it's really good to make it to the Olympics to we want to medal at the Olympics. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And 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 that to me is so huge in terms of um, what we're shooting for. You know, marathoners in in America for the last I don't know how long have been able to say, well, you know, I just I want to run 212 and make an Olympic team or something, right? And put together 212 on the right day. And now it's a core of guys that are watching what Galen Rupp's doing, watching you know me um, a part of it, but watching as well what you know all of the Americans are doing on the on the world stage, and thinking, why not? Right? Why yeah. not? And, and, and so the new up and coming marathoner doesn't think, all right, if I run 212, that's great. They think, man, if I can podium at a major marathon or if I can make it to the Olympics and get on the podium there, then that's great. And then mindset has changed. And so I don't know. I, I, I see up and comers, I mean, or the carrying the torch, the mantle, whatever, as a lot of the same guys that did it this last Olympics. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm looking at to team leaders, and you talk about the distance events. You know, Galen Rupp's at the front of it, forefront for sure. Um, Evan Yeager, Matt mm. Sensuous, these guys yeah. who have who have medaled. I expect them to come back and do it again. And but but also, you know, I think that now the guy is debuting in the marathon and we're having a bunch of them then the next olympic trials is going to be you know half of the same guys maybe but then another another half of of up and comers that have yeah. a chance of making the team and i think those guys have a different attitude now you know everyone wants to make the team but it's not just about making the team it's yeah. about making the team because we want to go and we want to make a dent in the tokyo medal stand yeah and, um, and that's cool yeah that's uh and i think you know we probably talk about this all day in the American mindset, and that's uh, we were. Wa- I was actually watching with my dad about la- two nights ago, and we were watching a recap called the Golden Games for London. Um, and for you see the sprinters were the dominating along with Jamaica and some of the islands in sprinting. And when they ran the four by one, they said the USA was really looking to get back this giant their gold medal that they owned. And what's cool is that you know you look at distance running in the United States and some of the European countries back in the early 1900s. Uh, we didn't have really the African countries as competition or some of the more Eastern countries. And now that we do, it's actually, even though we've lost some of the placing that we did when we were or like over 100 years ago, um, it's better because now we can come back and say we've won it and we won it against the best. Um, and I think that's really important. And watching this Olympics, I mean, you know, uh, you're talking about Matt Centrowitz, you know, he was running against, I think, the most stacked field I've seen in the 1500. And he not only won it, but he he said, this is my race. You're all going to do what I'm going to do. And they ran like, I think, an 800 that I could have beaten them at in the first for the first 800. <laughs> it was so slow. Right. But he controlled the race and he won it. And you watch Evan Yeager go out there, get a second for us. Um, Emma Coburn with a third. And then obviously our amazing a marathon team. I'm sure if Meb hadn't been cramping so much, uh, he would have been right up there right. with you and Galen. But you and Galen... You know, top ten. That's amazing. That it went a medal out right. of it too. And so the USA coming back to Tokyo, I tell people like, we're coming back for our medals. <laughs> we're coming back to be number <laughs> well, that's one. That's what I and I think. You know, you talk about some of the women, and you know, I, I haven't even mentioned the women, but I think that they 
have had this attitude for longer yeah. than the men's side has. I think our women have always owned up to the reality that they can finish on the podium and they go out there on a mission to do it um, and to break American records in the process, if not the podium, right, or world yeah. records. And so I, I, you know, I'm grateful to see, I almost feel like our guys are catching up to the mentality that our women have had for a while. Oh, yeah, you know, I think that's, I think, obviously, Kenya, for you guys, in distance running in general, is the looming giant for distance running. Kenya produces, like, top 90 marathoners a year, it's said in a statistic. But you watch, you know, the last London steeplechase uh, for the world champs, and Emma Covert and Courtney Fredericks going out there and stealing one and two. It was crazy. It's, and it's crazy to see what America's doing, and, you know, we're, we're not saying, you know, when it comes to these big races, okay, it doesn't matter where you've placed before. It matters what you do now on this on the stage. And America right. is proving that we're giving it our all, and we're prepared to come and do that. Um, so with that said, you know, after Rio and the amazing, amazing finish you had there and all that you've been accomplishing, uh, what are kind of your future plans for future uh, marathons coming up? Uh, what, what's your goals? Obviously, uh, Tokyo is another two, two to three years away. Um, so what are your plans for the future? So, you know, I have Tokyo in the sights and trying to put myself in a position to mm -hmm. make that team and then to go and, and, uh, better the finish. Um, but that's a long ways away. Like the, honestly, that's the, that's the longest r furthest out running goal that I've ever had in my life. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I, my yeah. goals have been always been right in front of me, the next race. And then yeah, so to have this kind of looming ahead. Tokyo <laughs> is different. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, three to five training cycles ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. That's I mean that's it. But um, you know I think so. In between now and then, I you know I had a a bumpy twenty seventeen. Um, struggled with with a, a hip pelvis injury for, mm. you know that that put me on a roller coaster through through twenty seventeen. Trying to hurry back and be ready for races, and then exiting those races a little bit banged up and back on the cycle. And so I feel blessed to be starting 2018 healthy and I think uh, you know with uh, with my sights high I, I'm not planning a spring marathon I think I'm gonna wait until the fall mm -hmm. to hit another marathon so I'm gonna revisit my my speed you know when yeah. I say speed you know maybe a half marathon or a 10k or something yeah. right and it, I've even thought about getting back on the track this spring and kind of uh, um, revisiting that and then working into a fall marathon um and then probably a spring marathon 2019 and then it's probably the olympic trials so really it's probably oh. two marathons away and and uh and i would love to run a fast time i want to get on a course um and and run a pr my, my yeah. pr comes from rio and it was um maybe less than optimal uh, yeah. uh, racing conditions for fast times there. And so I'd like to get on a fast course and see if I can lower that a little bit. And then I'd like to get uh, uh, in another U.S. Uh, major marathon and try to get on the podium. And um, that's where the sights are. And maybe they happen in this in this cycle and maybe they have to wait. Uh, you know, maybe they're a few years in the making. But but I really, you know, my, my mentality changed after Rio, I think, you know, as as you were mentioning, you know, I I looked at the top uh, marathoners in the world, and you know, mentioned all of them are coming from, you know, a lot of them are coming from those African countries, and they're running 204, and they're running 205, and the and the smucks are running 206, and uh, yeah. and I thought, man, that you know, they're they're finishing, and I have more than a mile to the finish, and so I I kind of looked at myself on a different level, um, and then I had the opportunity to race some of those guys in the Olympics and realize that there's a lot that happens and, um, mm -hmm. and it's different when you're just racing than when you're at this, you know, a time trial in Dubai or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and so I think that changed my mentality from a, I'm racing against myself and let's see how low I can get my PR and let's see what I can do to, I'm racing to beat these guys yeah. and I want to put myself in the best position just like, you know, Meb, Meb's PR is 208 and he's won Boston, he's won New York and he has a medal from the Olympics and, you know, it's that kind of, um, I don't know, picture that I hope to paint is just get into these races, mix it up with these guys, put yourself in a position and, uh, and try to finish as high as I can and so I think that's what I look to over the next few years. Yeah, um, so I guess... Uh... For marathoners, what would you tell an up-and-coming marathoner um, who's looking at their debut um, down the road? You know, I think um, I think to have figure out how to have fun in the training. Mm -hmm. You know, the the training gets 
uh, even more monotonous than distance training for a 5K or 10K on the track, right? And so uh, figure out ways to that you can have fun because you have to be consistent as a marathon. Or I remember reading um, that uh, uh, Haile Geber Selesi had said something like, it takes four years of consistent training to develop a good marathon or something like that. And, and that was his number, and I don't know what the number is, but I think one of the biggest things for marathoning is consistent, healthy training. Yeah, and yeah. so I think you want to be successful at the marathon, you got to debut somewhere. But I think the reality is you have to be on a program that is sustainable and, yeah. and you can't push yourself so hard that you're on the brink of injury all the time or else the injury yeah. is going to cut, catch up with you and you're yeah. going to get injured. Um, and so I think developing a base and a healthy system that you can stay healthy, um, as you train over the course of years, uh, you know, if you want to be a marathoner. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I guess one other thing, uh, I guess it's off the topic of running, but what is it like to be a teacher at BYU? Um, what is your daily day look like along with marathon marathoner yeah. and researching <laughs> and your kids and everything else? Uh, it's a, it's a balance act, but I feel like when everything I'm doing in life is stuff that I love and it's, it's not a, a task to balancing it. It's an opportunity to try to balance all the things that I love, but I, I teach two days a week at BYU. And so, um, on the days that I teach, I'll get up and I'll have a run in the morning mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll get to get to school. I'll teach my class. I have some office hours, maybe some time for research um, meet with some students and then I'll go down and do another workout session. You know, I'm blessed that my coach, uh, was my coach at BYU. Mm -hmm. So when I'm on campus, I'm, you know, I'm spending some time with coach too, or working out with him. So I normally get two running sessions in built around those days and they, they make for long days. I'm away from, from my family on the teaching days for a good chunk of the day. And then the other days are the days to focus more on the running aspect where, you know, I, I have, all the day to play with where I'm going to get my one or two runs in and or a cross training session and a lifting session in. Um, but I love that the running is flexible and I can bend it around uh, having the chance to drop off my five-year-old at kindergarten or take my kids to the park in the middle of the day or lay down with my one-year-old for a nap, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, after a run. Like, I feel like it's, it's awesome that, um, it, it m melds in with my family life really well. And so, you know, the days are, are different, um, but they're normally a run in the morning and, and some kid time and a run in the afternoon and some dinner time and, you know, something in the evening, a lift or a stretch or yoga or a cross training session mm -hmm. or something like that. And it's filled in the cracks with, um, my wife's a massage therapist. So I'll be laying on the couch and she'll be rubbing out whatever, oh. um, whatever I messed up. And I've got a kid that's, uh, doing Superman over my chest, and, you know, and, it, <laughs> and, but it all fits together. And so, um, sometimes it's busy, but it, but it works. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think, you know, as we, you know, this part of the interview is what means a lot to me and Dustin, cause we see, we've seen it in our own, own lives and our, you know, running for us isn't nearly taking as much of a toll as it does for Olympians for what you guys have to do. But, you know, uh, Mo Farah said after his 2008 in Beijing, he, he ran the 5k only and he didn't even make it out of the, the qualifying round. And he was in Disney World actually with the British team and said, I was seeing a few of the Kenyans actually training in Florida. And he goes, I saw what they did and I saw what they worked on and I saw how they trained and I realized, okay, I need to bump my training up and really my focus. And I think for even runners in high school, my parents didn't really know about it, uh, what it took to be a runner until they saw me. And it's more than just running, it's stretching, relaxing, trying to find time to get your body healthy, cross training. Um, and it's funny because I think families adjust to it well because they see what it does for us as humans, you know, as we the runners do and how it motivates us. And, you know, you guys as Olympians, especially being a marathon runner, it consumes so much of your day and it does consume a lot of family time. I think Mo Barra even said he's gone away from six months of the year from his family. Um, and I know it's got to be hard on you being a teacher and having another job on top of that because people don't realize that runners don't always make the most money. Obviously, some runners yeah. do like Usain Bolt and stuff like that, but we're not a basketball type sport. So we, some of us do have other jobs and do other things. Um, but I was going to say to bring this at the end of this kind of the question to wrap up, you know, it, it's, it's tedious, but people see how enjoyable and how meaningful it is in our lives. And for you, take all, taking all the way the, the running aspect from your college and high school and and obviously you're a re Olympian and all that. What is running done for you as a human being? How does it, I guess, spiritually affect you? How does it uh, work in your everyday-to-day lives and all that you're doing? 
Well, I, you know, the life as a marathon like can strike so many parallels. Like I, I don't know. I think that I have an endless supply of uh, church talks and whatever else, just as a marathon, right? Because it seems to apply so well. This patient, um, you know, keep keep pushing, you know, mentality. But I think in general, what running has taught me is is how rewarding um, doing your best can be. And I, you know, and, and maybe that, you know, I hope that doesn't seem kind of one-sided coming from, um, you know, someone who could be considered of having relative success. Success is all relative. But I, I really feel like um, what I've learned is that it's rewarding to do your best. Yeah. And, you know, in the Olympics, I was made fun of at the finish line by some of the some of the media for being the most excited sixth-place finisher that they've <laughs> ever seen. Yeah. I guess... I guess there's not a lot of excited six place finishes in the Olympics, but I was, and and I feel like that has taught me so much. Um, just the using the people around me to push me to a new level, yeah. to uh, to try a little bit harder. I mean, that um, that has benefited me. I remember somebody asking me after the Olympics was over if it was all worth it, and I remember thinking. I don't remember what I told them, but I thought about that a lot after because there was a lot that went into that. Moving to altitude, my wife and my kids, and um, there was a lot of sacrifices that went into the training and the reality of, of that goal. And um, I eventually decided that I didn't know if it was worth it just to be at the Olympics. In 10 years, I'll be that guy trying to convince his kids that he's cool because he went to the Olympics and they'll be like, no, you didn't, you, you know, and like, <laughs> it'll only be me and my coach and my mom that remembers that I actually ever was at the Olympics. <laughs> but, um, but the lessons that I learned getting there, I think of the Olympic trials and some of the things I learned about myself in the middle of that race, realizing that that was a race, not just for me, but for everyone that had invested in me as a runner. And I realized, you know what, I'm, I'm really not just running for me, I'm running for everyone that's invested in me. Or, or in the middle of the Olympics when I was cramping at 16 miles and I thought, I don't know if I can make it to the finish line, but I realized I could make it one more mile. And so that was all I was gonna worry about was one more mile. And then after that mile, I was gonna worry about the next mile. And I think about lessons like that that I learned and I think, you know what, it was worth it for that. And I would, do, I would do everything again in a heartbeat to know what I know now about myself and to have learned the things that apply to way more than just running from the experience. And, um, you know, I think it would be sad if, you know, we looked back on some – some big running careers, and if the if the athletes in those careers could only say, well, yeah, it was worth it for the medal stand or whatever, because yeah. that's a sixty second experience, and then it's gone, and then the next Olympics, someone else is up on the medal stand. <clears throat> but for me, um, some of the things that I learned were worth way more than that. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, one thing I guess we probably sh should have hit on that we didn't um, early <laughs> on. What is it like uh, being at BYU? What effect do you? What um? I guess role do you play on around the team at BYU? Um, obviously, so, uh, the program. Yeah, and I love the program and and have wanted to give back to it. Coach Eystone has me as a listed as a volunteer assistant on the mm -hmm. team, and I would say it's a very ancillary role. But I know those guys uh, fairly well, and I run with them. Um, you yeah. know, when I'm in Provo, and uh, occasionally we'll work out together if if it's a workout that's long enough for them or long enough, but still in their range, but short enough for me or whatever. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I've, I've loved working with those guys. And I think it brings a new energy to what I'm trying to do as a marathoner and, and gives me a little bit, a little taste of that team aspect. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's been super healthy for me and, and I've loved the involvement there. That's yeah, awesome. absolutely. Well, I think, and to wrap up, me and always Dustin to go over a little stuff. Um, to everyone that's watching, and we've grown so fast, so quick, ever than we could have imagined. Uh, you heard it from Jared himself, uh, an amazing marathoner, and all that he's accomplished. And that, you know, kind of a, I think a synonymous and parallel thing that you do see on this on this channel with all the people that we've interviewed, whether you're a high school or an Olympic athlete. Uh, running's hard, and running sucks uh, yeah. a lot, because it is. It, it pushes your body, and more importantly, it pushes your uh, your mind. Um, it makes you think about things in life that are tough to get through and that you don't always want to persevere. But it's not about the gold medal at the end of the race. It's the fact that you got somewhere farther than you were. 
And that is what we're trying to get on this channel and to you guys as viewers. Um, and for, I think, everything that Jared has said, you know, it's 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 about ex the experience itself, like being at Rio. You know, the metal p podium is only there for 10 seconds, 30 seconds, but it's, it's the moments that you cross the finish line or the whole race that you're running um, that matter. Uh, so with that said and the amazing talk that we've had today, we thank you so much for coming on. Um, we're definitely gonna be posting this and you know, uh, making sure that you get blasted and people start looking and being like, this guy is the next big American and he is our guy. Uh, and we're so uh, grateful that you got to come on today and just share your thoughts. Um, thank you so much. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. And thanks for all you're doing for the sport. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.